Testament calls Passover. Now, I was thinking about the idea of Passover. Matter of fact, I've thought about it all week because when I was in Lamentations, I just got excited about the whole idea of Passover and what it would have been like. I mean, think about what it would have been like to participate in that meal. For us, communion is a manufactured wafer and a little cup of grape juice. But see, for Jesus and for his disciples, and really for those in the early church, uh, what we call communion, their, their uh, agapeo, was much more than that. It was this feast where they got together and they ate bread and they ate meat. And so they all ate together. And so when they partook of this love feast, it was a bigger event than probably what we understand it to be. So as I was thinking about the idea of the Passover, does anybody know what event the Passover preceded? The exodus from Egypt. So if you set the context, uh, God has been dealing with Pharaoh and He's been dealing with him in a way to cause Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go free from Egypt because they presently had been slaves. So the last plague is about to fall on Egypt. And the last plague is going to be the death of every firstborn male in the kingdom of Egypt from the lowest born slave to the Pharaoh who sits on the throne. So on that night, God instructed Moses to tell the people, you're supposed to take a young lamb, and I want you to slaughter this lamb, and I want you to take some of its blood, and I want you to put it on the posts of the door. Put it on the top of the doorpost, and put it on the sides of the doorpost, and then you're to take this lamb, and you're to bring it into your house, and you're to cook it whole, basically eat the whole lamb. As a matter of fact, not only are you to eat the whole lamb, if there's anything that's left over, you're not allowed to let any of this lamb go to waste. So anything that's left over, you're going to consume it in the fire so that by morning there's nothing left. And so about midnight, I'm going to come through the land of Egypt and I'm going to strike down the firstborn male in every household. But when I see the blood on your door, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass over you and I'm going to spare you from the plague. And so what we see pictured in Passover is this type of Christ that is fulfilled in the New Testament, death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn of Mary. He is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And I found something very interesting as I was looking through the book of Luke. Does everybody know what the transfiguration is? What's a transfiguration? Yes. Peter, James, and John. So there is this event in all three of the synoptic gospels called the transfiguration. And so they're, they're, it's interesting because they're all preceded and I believe ended by the same things. The transfiguration of G Jesus is preceded by Peter's declaration that He is the Messiah in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As a matter of fact, I believe it's Mark 9, Luke 9, and Matthew 17. And in every instance, there's always this declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, and that there is also the, 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 the miraculous multitude of bread and fish. But in the middle of those events, there's this time when Jesus takes with Him Peter and James and John, and He goes up on a mountain, and it says as they were there, and again, the accounts... I don't want to say very, but they're just different details that you know one writer gives us that maybe the other writer didn't. So, so Jesus' transfiguration. This is what we know about this transfiguration. And so it's actually Matthew and Luke who give us the word transfigured. They say Jesus was transfigured. Now in Greek, that word transfigured is metamorphosis. And we all know from Romans what that means, right? It's this transforming process that begins on the inside and kind of works its way out. We also know the Incredible Hulk analogy, which I love to use. So that is what this, this metamorphosis is, this radical change. So as the disciples, uh, Peter and James and John, as they kind of realize what's going on, they see Jesus and He is transfigured. And they describe it like this. His face shone like the sun and His, body, his clothes were a gleaming white like lightning. So there is something that is going on, not just in the physical appearance, but in the physical DNA of Jesus' body that is transforming Him into something that is glorified now. I believe what we see in this moment is this time when Jesus 
for an instant in his mortal life is going to step out of his flesh and truly be glorified as the Son of God. Now, we're going to see it a little bit later, but right now it's pretty early in the game for that to happen. So he's glorified, and then they see Peter, or Peter and James and John, then they see Moses and Elijah who were talking with Jesus. And obviously, there's a reason those two guys are there. I mean, who is it that sums up the law in the Old Testament? Well, it's Moses, obviously. And then we've got Elijah who sums up the prophets. I mean, Elijah was the prophet who never died, right? He didn't pass away on this earth physically like we pass away. He was actually taken into heaven in a chariot of fire. So you've got Moses and Elijah who are there with them on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when Peter realizes it, and, and so uh, 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 Mark actually says, uh, Peter said, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three booths, one for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. And you know what happens when he says that? This cloud come and hides him from their sight. And Mark says, because he, they didn't know what to say. So in this moment of like nervous discussion, Peter does what Peter does so well. And he just blurts out, let's build some booths here. But there is something that Luke brings out in the transfiguration of Jesus when his body is being transformed and glorified. Did you know Luke tells us what they talked about? Did you know that? Because, you know, we know Matthew and, Luke, or Matthew and Mark say they talked with Jesus. Did you know that Luke actually tells us what they talked about? Who knew that? See, that's why I get to be the pastor. I find out this stuff that, you know, no one else really knows. Did you know that, Tyler? Wow, is this how you feel all the time? <laughs> it's like, I feel like the way feel, Tyler feels all the time when anybody, when anybody asks something. That's awesome. I like that. So let me read to you what Luke says about the, uh, Jesus and, 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 and uh, Moses and Elijah talked about. So this is what it says. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter and John and James with him up onto a mountain place to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. Now, look at what it says next. It says, they spoke about his departure. Do you know where that word departure translates from in Greek? You're going to love this. Well, let me just say, I love this anyways. The Greek word for departure that Luke uses is the word exodus. So you know what they're talking about while Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration? They're talking about His exodus from this earth. Now again, what I want you to see is the connection from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, we're talking about the, the, the Hebrew people who had been enslaved in bondage, but Moses is going to be the leader who takes them out of bondage into a land flowing with milk and honey. It is the promised land. I want you to see the connection because in the New Testament, what we're about to do is experience that moment when we come to grips with the reality that we who were dead in trespasses and sin, we were in bondage to our earthly nature, but Jesus came into this world to lead us on our exodus from this life so that we too can be preparing to go to a land that flows with milk and honey. Although that analogy in the New Testament doesn't really do it for, for us most of the time. So I'm going to say it this way. He's leading us to a land where there is no setting sun. He is leading us to a land where the Lamb is the light and it's day all the time. Jesus is preparing a journey. We're going on an exodus and we're headed to a place where there is no more crying and there's no more pain. There are going to be no more tears and there's no parting. And we will be with the Lord forever and ever free from the sin of this world. That's the exodus that Jesus is preparing for. Now just to clarify a little bit more, Luke goes on to say, they talked about his departure or, or his exodus which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. So what is the means by which Jesus brought about this exodus where we shake off our mortality and put on immortality? It was his death on the cross. And that is what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the death of Jesus Christ because in his death we are cleansed of our sin 
and in his resurrection, we begin the exodus to a new life. Phil and Mitch, if you would, could you come and serve the elements for me? As they come, I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray.